When I started this retrospective, I expected to come back to each of these games knowing how I'd feel about them. Thus far, my expectations have been shattered. Kingdom Hearts has risen from mediocrity into a game I genuinely enjoy despite its quirks, while Chain of Memories is an inverse on that idea, quickly becoming one of the worst I've ever played. Some of you might consider that strong language. Surely Chain of Memories isn't that bad. Card systems are strange, but that shouldn't be the thing to ruin Kingdom Hearts. Here's the thing, I can imagine a world where Chain of Memories is actually good, so let's cut that complaint right out of the gate. I do not hate this game because it has a card combat system, as unorthodox as it is. Like I said, I see a world where this system promotes a far more strategic combat approach than Kingdom Hearts 1. The problem is that Chain of Memories ends up embracing some of the worst aspects of card games and attempts to mix it with an action RPG. This game has a duality problem, an oil and water concoction of frustration and boredom, a lot of interesting ingredients that don't play well together. I'll be examining what Square and Nomura seem to consider the definitive version of the game, the PS2 remake titled Re-Chain of Memories released in 2008, two years after the release of the PlayStation 3. Probably the reason I wasn't aware of this remake's existence until it was shoehorned into the HD remaster collections. This doesn't mean I won't talk about the original GBA version, a surprising number of people consider that version to be definitive. It just means that I'll be using ReChain as the basis for my overall critique and conclusions. It's hard to argue that it isn't the most relevant, easily accessible version that everyone getting into the series will pick up through the HD collection. Let's embark on a Chain of Memories retrospective. <laughs> I'd like to recap some important points from Kingdom Hearts 1 before I jump in proper. I've decided to avoid a full-on summary. I know I don't really care to sit through a bunch of plot synopses, but since Kingdom Hearts can get fairly convoluted, I feel it's my responsibility to at least drive by the previous game's cliff notes going forward. Kingdom Hearts 1 was the origin of the Heartless Outbreak by a scientist known as Ansem. By reading the Ansem reports, you get more insight on how he opened the doors to the hearts of all worlds, which is why Sora was traveling to said worlds and closing the keyholes before the Heartless devoured them. Ansem was so driven by his curiosity that he turned himself into a Heartless as indicated by the Heartless symbol on his chest, differentiating artificially created Heartless and natural Heartless. Basically, any Heartless with a symbol was created by this guy, and the rest are naturally occurring. It's important to note that Ansem was once human and turned into a Heartless, as it'll be an important point in future games. Same thing with Sora. When he sacrificed himself to save Kairi, he had three- <clears throat> At this point, we knew he had two hearts inside him, so it's really important to note here, Sora became a Heartless by releasing both his heart and Kairi's. Keep that in mind as we go on. Shifting to Riku for a moment, he succumbed to the darkness and was possessed by Ansem. He also momentarily took the Keyblade away from Sora, which you'd better believe is going to be important later. Unfortunately, he isn't able to stop Ansem from fully taking him over, so he ends up on the other side of what we think is Kingdom Hearts. More on that in Kingdom Hearts 2. Upon Ansem's defeat, King Mickey and Sora seal Kingdom Hearts from both sides, leaving Sora, Riku, and Kairi separated once again. Sora stranded in a land unknown, Riku stuck in the Realm of Darkness, and Kairi back on Destiny Islands. Thankfully, this is about all you'll need to know for now, which brings us to Castle Oblivion. Chain of Memories doesn't do an amazing job explaining how or where Castle Oblivion is, so for right now, just believe me when I say it's in the realm in between the light and the dark. That's how both Sora and Riku end up there, even though they were on opposite sides of Kingdom Hearts. Castle Oblivion and Naminé are the two best parts of this story. The idea that the further Sora pushes into Castle Oblivion, the more memories he'll lose is fascinating as a concept. Imagine what you'd be without your memories. Even stranger, imagine what you'd be if your memories were supplanted by fake ones. 
Memories of your loving father replaced by memories of an abusive one. Memories of your life partner replaced by memories of a completely different person. It's scary to think that you wouldn't even know the difference. That's how I felt watching Sora as Naminé pushed herself further and further into his synapses. He starts to beat himself up over not being able to save Naminé, he fights with Riku over her, he abandons Donald and Goofy when they start doubting his newfound affection. Like, think about this from the perspective of Naminé. She's quite clearly a loner, and expresses that although Marluxia was forcing her hand, at the end of the day, she just wanted friends. So, she creates a set of memories to make two boys fight over her because they care for her so much. She gets exactly what she wants, at the cost of Sora's entire being as it was shaped by his memories. What always gets me about it is that our resident best boy immediately forgives her, even if he is a little worried about his old memories. It's like this. I'm really not happy about you messing with my memories. But, you know, I can't really get mad at you for it either. These memories you gave me. In my head, I know they're lies. But they still feel right. He just knows she's a nice person. He believes in her completely and resolves to try his absolute hardest to never forget her when she restores his memories. Even if, tragically, he does end up forgetting about her. I also really enjoy the new villains in the form of the Organization, as they're referred to in this title specifically, a group of black hoods that supposedly lack hearts. Axel, voiced by Quentin Flynn, is an absolute treat in any game he's in. I always get a kick out of him killing Vexen. With... Uh. Ah! <gasps> Axel! Yo, Sora. Did I catch you at a bad time? Marluxia is one of Nomura's best character designs. There's something about his presence that feels manipulative and toxic. Just watch this scene, it creeps me out. That would be an unfortunate denouement. What to do? Your hero is soon to be wiped from existence. But I believe there is a certain promise that he made you. Isn't that right, Namine? The other organization members are fairly unremarkable, besides Larxene having a crazy good voice actress, thus making pretty much all her scenes 10 out of 10 material. Yes, she is. You see, the bad guys are holding her captive, somewhere deep inside the castle. And you obviously are the hero, so you have to go save her. Although... Ah! I'm a bad guy, so you have to go through me. They mostly exist to create original boss fights. Now, this is all well and good, but the way you experience the story almost ruins it flat out for me. What I've been talking about here is substantial new story content. The rest is shameless retreadings of Disney worlds with a slight thematic link to the idea of memories. None of them are voiced, because I guess they only had the time and resources to record entirely new stuff with their established actors, and not the A-list, sometimes B-list Disney voice actors. What pains me the most is that they all follow a set, rigid pattern throughout each of the labyrinths. Enter Wonderland. Oh hey, it's the White Rabbit. He's late again, that rascal. Oh, what's this? Key of beginnings? Okay, I guess we're chasing after him. Commence exploration of the labyrinth. Find the door, and oh hey, it's Alice. She's being framed again, in the exact same way as before. Except this time, she's accused of stealing memories. Oh no. Uh-oh, let's fight the cards again, because they still had those models lying around. Might as well. Oh hey, a key of guidance. Commence exploration of Labyrinth. Find the door, and yeah, look, look, it's the Cheshire Cat, who spouts cryptic, meaningless bullshit at you about memories, then disappears. Oh hey, the key of truth. Commence exploration of Labyrinth, find the door, and oh hey, it's the Trick Master, that iconic boss from the one game prior. Alice saves the day, she sure showed the Queen of Hearts. You know, I want to ask an honest question. Why do the Disney worlds even have a story? I understand the appeal of reusing most of the worlds from the original game, especially since it debuted on the Game Boy Advance. The novelty of seeing Kingdom Hearts on the go, at the time, isn't lost on me. 
Hell, I remember having a ton of fun with it on car rides because it was exactly that, Kingdom Hearts on the go, with an admittedly strange card battle system. Even in the GBA version though, you have to admit, there was no reason to write the story for the Disney worlds, even with the parallel dimension tier minute differences to said plot. They don't contribute anything to the overall plot, because Sora and company have to act like they don't know anyone there, because the people there are from Sora's memories, so... They don't know who Sora is? But they do kind of know who he is at the same time? Uh, what if instead of playing out the same stories again, Sora and company initially remembered everyone, but then slowly forgot about them over the course of time? That'd fit much better with the theme they're going for, but I suppose that'd be a little too much work for a handheld, quote-unquote, spin-off. I know why they tried, to be fair. Nomura created this game in the first place because he thought kids would want a way to experience Kingdom Hearts on the go, so he more or less remade the game for handhelds. Admirable approach, but it seems to miss what made the story of the first game special in the first place, while also missing that the story is treated as if it was a sequel rather than a spin-off or remake. He did create the story to explain what happened in between Kingdom Hearts 1 and 2, to explain why Sora loses all of his abilities, yet he seems to have created the actual game under the pretense of a remake of KH1 for the GBA, using characters and ideas cut straight from the first game. We're left with this weird hybrid of an interquel remake. It's even more transparent than you might think. I'm assuming this game and its remake were cheap endeavors, considering Nomura was thinking about Kingdom Hearts 2 far before he started thinking about Chain of Memories. Why do you think all of these totally not original Do Not Steal boss fights are in each Disney world? Why do you think Mickey's voice actor is... I found a card to help me! I needed a way out of the realm of darkness, and then suddenly this card appeared right in front of me. When I picked it up, I could see your heart beyond the darkness. That's what let me find you. <sighs> Why do you think they use the same two cutscene tracks throughout the entire game? You seem pretty intrigued by this Sora kid. Too clever. Why do you think you fight the organization members multiple times nearly unchanged? Seriously, you go from fighting a pretty difficult Vexen, then entering Twilight Town and fighting the same Vexen again, with one more health bar on the key of beginnings. I mean, jeez, at least build it up. Or maybe the six fucking times you fight Riku Replica, I'm sure that won't get old anytime soon. Pair that with having to fight the same exact bosses when you play as Riku, and you've got yourself a recipe for repetition and sheer boredom. It's most evident when playing as Riku that they really wanted to make the most out of what they had. He treks through the exact same Disney worlds, but only to fight the boss with the key of beginnings. His campaign is all about watching a cutscene, going to a Disney world, fighting a boss, watching another cutscene, maybe fighting an organization member or something, doing another Disney world, fighting a boss, watching a cutscene. In essence, that's what Sora's campaign is as well, they just tried to hide it better by keeping you in the Disney worlds much longer than Riku. It's a shame, too, because I enjoy the duality between Sora and Riku's story. They're both being tested in completely different ways. Sora tested by Namine in the organization as his memories are rewritten, and Riku learning to use the darkness instead of fearing it. Unfortunately, it never feels like the game is trying to say anything meaningful like the first game did, or even that it has enough breathing room to say anything in the first place. As I mentioned, this is less a sequel to Kingdom Hearts 1 as it is an interlude between 1 and 2, which is fine, but I'm not gonna try digging into a narrative that isn't there. It's just disappointing, which I guess isn't exactly a great foot to start out on. A promise is a promise. Yes. One day the light. It will be ours, and it will bring us together. Till then, I'll be in your heart. Right. Forgotten. But not lost. Chain of Memories, as I mentioned, is a double-sided dilemma. In many ways, it's everything I hate about video games wrapped neatly into one package, but I can break it into two broad categories. Frustration and boredom. Card games are fun, right? Numbered cards in your deck, the capacity of which increases by your choosing upon a level up, alongside a health boost or a new slight combo. Every action you perform is bound to a card. Attack cards, magic cards, item cards, summon cards, and you need to configure your deck in between fights to your liking. 
Maybe you'll stack it full of attacks to spam more slates, but you'll also want items so that you can quickly reload cards. I do like building a deck, it's probably the most entertaining part, but it's when the bosses break your deck in half that we run into trouble. See, most card games rely on card packs, but with the possibility of buying individual cards from stores or trading them with friends. That's why many of them are considered trading card games. Chain of Memories is built exactly like a trading card game, but there's one crucial difference. RNG decides everything. Cheeky viewers will be eager to remind me that games like Hearthstone are RNG, but in this case I mean it literally. The only way to get cards is to find them randomly in the world by striking lampposts or by using a Moogle map card. You always get a free pack of 5 cards when you put down a Moogle map card, but you need to buy the rest with Moogle points that you collect by killing Heartless or striking random objects in the overworld. This is the only way to get cards, aside from the special item or defense cards you get from boss fights. Already, your deck composition is completely out of your control, and if you don't consistently roll snake eyes, your deck is gonna be truly incompetent. As I said, there are numbers on each card. This number represents the value of the card in play at any given moment in battle. For instance, when you use a number 6 keyblade, Sora will attack with a normal keyblade swing. That number doesn't designate power necessarily. The number is to determine which card the enemy will need to interrupt your action, or card break. In this case, the enemy would need a 6 or higher if they want to counterattack with their own move. You'd think this is as simple as it gets, it's just about flipping through the deck and selecting a card that's equal to or greater than your opponent's, and making sure not to play many weak cards that are easily broken. Problem, there's even more to it. Zero cards can break any number at the price of them also being broken by any number. These cards are really useful for breaking higher numbers, which can get up to a total value of 27. By pressing the triangle button, you store a card in the top left, and once you get three of them up there, you'll activate a slate. Sometimes this just means that you'll perform said actions in the order you put them up there, but if you have a special set of cards or achieve a specific sum, you can pull off a special slate combo. For instance, getting a sum anywhere from 20 to 23 using different keyblade types will allow you to use the slate Sonic Blade. Every time you use a slate, the first card you put into that slate will break for the rest of the fight, unless you have a special item to reload it into your deck. Removing the cards from a slate combo is done to ensure that you can't spam slates, because eventually you'll be stuck with the same two cards for the rest of the fight. At least, this is how it's supposed to work on paper. During most boss fights, it actually does work like this, but during practically any fight with the Heartless, it never applies. You can spam slates all damn day, since fights with the Heartless don't last nearly as long as boss fights do. I am not exaggerating when I say that I got through the entire game spamming slates and almost nothing else. Enemies don't have a way to fight back against high total values that you get from slates. Meanwhile, you're steamrolling them with high value combo attacks, and by the time you run out of cards to use, all of the Heartless are dealt with anyway. Thus, you are rewarded for taking the path of least resistance, using the optimal strategy to spam triangle and win, but are then deposited onto boss fights that punish this very approach. At first, it's infuriating to fight bosses, because you'll just run at them like you've been running at everything else, spamming the triangle button. But because bosses have such huge health bars, you'll often find yourself stuck without any cards. Most bosses have high total values, and some of them like to spam high value slates a lot, so without the firepower to fight back, you may as well bite the dust. Once you learn to stop brute forcing boss fights, keep in mind that the heartless encounters never get hard enough that you'd stop spamming slates, so yeah, for boss fights and boss fights only, you need to think up a strategy, right? Multiple extremely aggravating problems there. Number one, it's all based on RNG. Whether you get high value cards is completely up to chance, and it's not like all cards are equal here, oh no. Sure, there are some slates that can only be activated with a lower total value, so in some sense lower value cards are helpful, but if we're being realistic, lower value slates are just gonna get broken immediately and lack the high values necessary to break a terrifying slate from the boss. Stacking your deck with numbers 6 through 9 is not at all punished. In fact, it's nigh on essential so you can start spamming Sonic Blade as soon as you get it to break the game. Before that though, assume you're a bab like I was a few weeks ago and you didn't even know how easy it was to break this game because you didn't have the ability to break it in the first place. Apparently I'm not a very lucky guy because I got a plethora of 1 to 5 cards and not a single 7, 8, 9, or especially a 0 card. By the time I got to Vexen, the game had decided to grace me with two zero cards and a bunch of middle tier card values. 
I wasn't able to use any of my slates because he'd either have a slate more powerful than mine, or he'd flip through his deck at lightning speed, play one of his 8 million zero cards, and break my combo instantly, all while I didn't exactly have many of my own zeros or high value slates to fight back. Rechain of Memories isn't designed around you being able to block every single attack because it expects you to break their cards before the attack can happen. That's why zero cards are so good, that's why you don't have a block button, only a roll. That's why Vexen has an ice attack that insta-freezes you, requiring that you preemptively roll to avoid being frozen. Some attacks, like this AoE fire thing from Axel, I'm near certain is unavoidable. Card breaks are encouraged by far the most, but it's kinda hard to do that when you don't have the cards necessary to play by the game's rules. Got stuck on Vexen for about a week and a half because I statistically couldn't outdo his deck. Eventually, I'd run out of cards. I'd try to flip through this massive deck to reach my one zero card in time, but I'd never make it. Vexen is designed for you to break his attacks, plain and simple. Unless it's a slate, he'll block your attacks with his shield if you initiate first. Therefore, you have to card break him to create an opening. I know exactly what this boss is teaching, but I lack the tools necessary to learn. To get out of my rut, I had to spend an obscene amount of time grinding so I could fit more cards into my deck, get use out of more items and defense cards, in a futile attempt to defeat Vexen. Eventually, I just had to grind for Moogle points so I could keep throwing money at card packs and praying to whatever deity exists that I can at least get SOMETHING competent. After several days of spread out grinding sessions, I finally had a deck I was proud of. But see, this is akin to a switch being flipped, a spiritual awakening to a higher plane of existence. I inadvertently obtained the necessary ingredients to stack my deck with repeated number values that led to a sum that gave me Sonic Blade, something I could keep spamming over and over and over with high potions and elixirs to reload my attack cards instantly. Without even meaning to, just grinding to get the necessary cards to survive, I met the requirements for the winning strategy. There is no in-between here, there is no period with which you struggle and it's fair, you're on two sides of the spectrum. Either the game hasn't given you enough cards to make it fair, or you finally have enough cards and bend the disc over backwards. Which brings me hurtling straight into boredom. Fixing the frustrating bosses, all you're left with is a broken video game. One where you hurl yourself through room after room, fight after fight, spamming buttons, listening to podcasts so you don't die of exhaustion exploring the same palette-swapped, randomized room layouts. I guarantee you that my brain was switched off for 75% of Sora's 20-ish hour runtime, with a generous 25% relegated to the boss fights. Thing is, it wasn't at all like this in the original. Maybe not every Heartless was a winner, maybe not every world was a home run, but you were always doing something new and exciting. Swimming around Atlantica and exploring for items, searching for a secret Heartless, fighting the secret bosses, doing something as simple as guarding, or rolling out of an attack, or walking around fat bodies to damage them with physical attacks. People always say Kingdom Hearts is a button masher, but you didn't just spam the X button. Ironically, Chain of Memories ends up being the button masher majority of the time. Slates are activated by spamming the triangle button, and you can configure your deck in a way to always activate slates even if all you're doing is sitting in place and mashing. If a high total value is in play, Heartless are incapable of breaking it, so they won't attack you, and if they have an attack coming at you, spamming the triangle button as quickly as possible will instantly break through the attack. Let me lob you a question. Why wouldn't you button mash? There are no realistic negative consequences for doing so. In fact, I'd argue that this is the quickest and most efficient way to end fights. Why wouldn't you just spam as many Sonic Blade slates as humanly possible against all the bosses? I'm just gonna lay some footage of Marluxia, the final boss by the way, as I explain how unreasonably broken Sonic Blade is. It's a series of slide attacks Sora can do by pressing triangle in sync with the visual prompt, and you can get about 7 or 8 hits in. Not only does it do almost a full health bar each time, absolutely no one can break out of it when they're stuck in it. In this game, if you're staggered, you can't activate cards or slates until you fully recover. It takes about a second to fully recover, but the problem is that Sonic Blade is so unbelievably fast that you can hit them again to restart their recovery cycle over and over and over. Chain of Memories doesn't really have a revenge value, that is, a modifier that decides if the enemy will break out of your attack and immediately retaliate. The only way they can do that is by card breaking, something they can only do after they've fully recovered. This is precisely why Sonic Blade is so broken. Even then, the boss I'm fighting right now doesn't stagger, but my sum card values from Sonic Blade are almost always high enough to ensure that I can't get countered. Seriously, look at Marluxia, he's the final boss, frequently considered one of the hardest in the entire game. And look at him! 
Oh, I should mention that I did some grinding to make Marluxia easier, got about five additional levels in Castle Oblivion, got higher health and deck capacity, stacked even more Sonic Blade combos, it was marvelous. Now, hold on a second, can I truly assess the difficulty of Marluxia if I intentionally trained beforehand to be much higher level than the game likely expects of me? Yes, I absolutely can. Consider this, the game forced me to grind before fighting Marluxia. Why? I lacked a specific map card needed to progress. The only way to get more map cards is by defeating Heartless. No ifs, ands, or buts. First of all, I should preface that map cards are what determine the room's properties. A normal map card will mean a normal, randomized layout with normal Heartless. While a minus two Heartless card means the same thing, but each Heartless will use weaker attack cards. There are map cards for rooms with special chests, more aggressive Heartless, sleeping Heartless, you name it. This is a thinly veiled attempt at keeping navigation interesting by allowing you to pick a bunch of different random wacky properties for each room based on the number requirement posted at each door. Some require a total sum of numbers, and some require a number greater than, less than, or equal to the number posted. You get so many of these cards grinding anyway that it shouldn't matter until you get further into the game and the map card requirements get far more strict. In Castle Oblivion, for instance, there's a door that requires a 1-value blue card, a 3-value red card, and then a sum of 99 to clear. I had most of the ingredients, except I needed a 1-value blue card. I tried for an hour to get one, spamming Trinity Limit, screen nuking everything, bashing my head into the wall as the Slippery Heartless kept going in and out of the ground, avoiding all my attacks, delaying the inevitable. I had to use multiple map cards to override already placed map cards since I had exhausted the available Heartless around me several times over. Eventually I got a roulette card which made it much easier to get what I was looking for because I can game the roulette pretty easily, but dear lord, this is a beyond horrible way to handle progression. RNG tied to core gameplay mechanics like, I don't know, main story progression is usually a recipe for disaster. Especially because in this case, you can't even buy more card packs with real money like you usually can nowadays. It's essentially like a mobile game that doesn't have microtransactions in it, which sounds cool until you realize that your only other option is to grind seemingly forever. Because it's a mobile game. Don't even try to BS me. You've seen most mobile games. Are you going to tell me that there is not a parallel here? Keeping up with this theme of duality, Riku offers a glimmer of hope into what this game could have been. Mostly with boss fights, the Heartless still die to the dreaded triangle spam. Instead of customizing your deck, Riku gets a set of preloaded cards for each fight, designed for each encounter. This means both that you won't lack the cards necessary to win, and that boss fights are far more balanced. You go into a fight with only the cards you absolutely need. Additionally, the card duel system managed to keep me on my toes at all times. When two equal cards lock, you enter a duel to rapid-fire card break a selection of cards from the enemy. The process in and of itself isn't super difficult, since you can spam through your deck to win most times. It's the initiation that intrigues me. Some bosses have longer attacks and keep their cards in play longer as a result. Frantically flipping through my deck to find an equivalent card to start a duel was infinitely more engaging than anything in Sora's story. In fact, during the final boss with Riku, my strategy devolved into me card breaking, going into dark form for better dodges and stronger slates, then initiating as many duels as humanly possible to end it. You can only enter dark form by card breaking a bunch, which is the only way you're going to be able to use your slates and do real damage to the bosses. It encouraged me to learn the preset deck for each fight, to know where all the card values were, so I could duel faster and more efficiently to get reliable damage. It takes a modicum of skill to do this that isn't present in the rest of the game, but it's such a shame that Riku was an afterthought instead of the basis for the entire game. He gets a solid 5 hours of gameplay, maybe 25% of Sora's story if I'm being generous, most of it dedicated to recycled enemies, bosses, and map layouts. It'll never fix the map card problems or the boring heartless encounters, but if the bosses were at least as fun as they were in Riku's story, I'd enjoy something about Chain of Memories. I could talk about the boss design, but seriously, what's the point? No matter the boss's moveset, it's ultimately the deck makeup that matters most. The boss slates are interesting, but at the end of the day, it's a number clash. You're gonna break those powerful slates with your own powerful slates. It's never about dodging or guarding at the correct times, is it? At that point, it doesn't even matter how the bosses are designed. It's Schrodinger's cat. When you have cards, each boss is a joke. When you don't have cards, each boss is BS, both existing simultaneously. Hey, I wouldn't be a true Zero Escape fan if I didn't put in a reference to Schrodinger's cat. 
I have no reason to come back to Chain of Memories. Even on the GBA, only a few of the core issues are fixed. Maybe it's easier to dodge attacks on a 2D plane, so the bosses won't be as hard to manage on a handheld. But that won't fix the rotting RNG core, it'll never fix it. Chain of Memories is the perfect example of a game I consider to be fundamentally flawed, easily my least favorite Kingdom Hearts game. Spoilers, I guess. Yes, I've played 358 Days, I've played Coded, never have I felt such a passionate hatred toward a Kingdom Hearts game. Never has there been a Kingdom Hearts game to fail on almost every level. Hey, hope you enjoyed my, my takedown of Chain of Memories. When I started writing the script, I expected to have more positive things to say, but it ended up being more of a rant. Anyway, if you enjoyed the video, I have a Patreon if you want to donate. Not gonna push you, don't push anyone, but I am thankful for all of my current patrons that you're now seeing on screen. If you can't donate, please comment below. I love having discussions with you all, that's why I keep doing this little business. I mean, I get some bad apples, but as long as you're civil, I'm not gonna get angry at you. Don't worry, I don't bite. Everything else, liking, disliking, just do what you want, do what you feel is right, as long as you justify it in the comments. My name is Ben King K, and I certainly hope you have some well-deserved fun today. But not with Chain of Memories. Stay far away from that game. Burn it if you have to.